I hope that everyone is ready and you've got your boots on. Today I've got my tall platform boots on because you are going to traipse um, <laughs> in a couple minutes virtually um, on some of the cultural heritage sites at the Alaska Native Heritage Center. Um, we have Mira DeWitt and Paul Asiksik who um, are just out and they're just getting their camera adjusted at the first heritage site. And we'd love for you to join us and see some of the incredible homes and the innovation that our ancestors here in Alaska um, created. And you can see sort of the place-based innovation of how specific houses were structured um, for protection, for warmth, and for um, being able to be prepared against the elements. And so with that, um, we're going to switch to Mita, and um, you're going to see Mita and Paul, and they're going to give you a nice tour of what we've got outside here. All righty. Welcome, everyone, to uh, we're back in Alaska at the Alaska Native Heritage Center in Anchorage. And uh, again, my name is Paul Siksik, and I'm from Shaktulik from the Bering Strait region. And uh, I was actually adopted into this culture that's here behind me. We have four cultures for the southeastern clan house or the longhouse. So we have the Eak, the Klinket, Klinket, Haida, Hada, and then also the Simshian people. So I was adopted into the Simshian culture. And the way I would introduce myself in that culture is Huk Amatseptawalyu, Lakshkigdipategu, uh, so I just told you I was from the Eagle Clan. I was adopted. My wife is Raven, and I am actually Eagle from the Eagle Clan. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk around to, uh, we'll be able to go into five, uh, maybe six. We'll walk around the outside of these different homes here that we have in our village sites at the Alaska Native Heritage Center. Each home is built a little bit differently to adapt to the environment. So what we've got is uh, behind me, we're standing in front of the southeastern clan house or the longhouse. So you have elements of uh, Sitka spruce, red cedar, yellow cedar. They have access to really nice uh, pieces of wood. So again, if I take my right hand and I go like this, I can make a map of Alaska. So the anchorage area is here. This is northern Alaska. The area that we're uh, concentrating on right now is the Gulf or the Southeast. So this is where we have that concentration of that red cedar uh, and the yellow cedar. So what we're using is the red cedar is very uh, important to the people of the Gulf or the Southeast. Uh, they use that to make their canoes, also to make the planks, and then also to make things like red cedar hats and baskets and different things like that. So the entranceway that we're standing in front of right now uh, one thing that they could do is when they were entering this home, they would walk in backwards. And then on the back of the dancers or the person entering the home on their back, they would have their family crest. It could be something like an eagle, a raven, maybe a killer whale or even a wolf. So this is the outside of the uh, southeastern clan house or the longhouse. Now let's move along a little bit. We're going to move over to something called the carving shed. So what we're standing in front of right now, uh, our southeastern carving shed, uh, what they did was is they built a facility like this to get out of the rain. So in the Gulf or the southeastern part of Alaska, it's not uncommon for them to get 13 to 16 feet of rain. So they would build a facility like this to get out of the rain, and they're making things like their canoes and then also their totem poles. So you can see... The, um, the carving shed here, and on the end there's copper. So copper is very important to the people of the Gulf of the Southeast. Uh, they utilize that in their potlatches and their ceremonies. And then moving over here, just a little bit, we were talking about the totem pole. We actually have a totem pole here at the Alaska Native Heritage Center. This was made by Nathan Jackson. He's a well-known clinket and kit carver. At the top there, that's made to represent the grandpa, the elder, uh, chief of the village, and then underneath that you have the nephew. Uh, in between the nephew's feet is something called the box of knowledge or the box of wisdom, and he's using the cover to hold up the elder. And then under that you have raven on the left, on my left, and then the eagle would be on my right. And then you've also got two children at the bottom, a girl and a boy, and they're carrying the weight of the ancestors, so that's the idea behind that particular uh, totem pole. So you're getting a chance to see the actual uh, 
totem pole that was made here at the Alaska Native Heritage Center. If you get a chance to visit us during the summertime, we're going to continue moving on to our next village site. If you get a chance to come over and visit us during the summertime, uh, stop by our southeastern clan house or the longhouse, and you'll get a chance to see uh, the house posts that we have inside our clan house. They are unique in that we have house posts from all four of the cultures, the Eak, the Tlingit, the Haida, and the Simshan. The Eak house post was one that was made they they had to take a look at really old photographs. One of them hadn't been made in over 70, 80 years, so they had to look at really old photographs. And they actually commissioned uh, Israel Shotridge, who's a Clinket Harbor. He worked with uh, Chief Maurice Smith Jones' family on how that Eat House Post should look. All right. The next area of Alaska that we're coming up to now is uh, on the Aleutian Islands and then also near Kodiak Island. So again, if I take my finger map and we move from the Gulf of Alaska, we're moving over to the Aleutian Islands for the Unungan, uh, commonly called the Aleut. Uh, we'll hear the terms Unungan or Ununga. And then right by my fingertip here, we have Kodiak Island and the mainland for the Aleutic or the Sukhbak people. So this particular uh, home that we're standing outside of here, it wasn't uncommon for some of these areas along the Aleutian Islands. Some of these homes actually got as long as a football field. They would house the entire village. What they would do is make these semi-subterranean, so they're building these partially under the ground. What they want to do is find a hill so that the water can run off, and then they're taking the, um, the driftwood, the wood that washes up on the shore uh, from the ocean. They're taking that driftwood and using that as the framework and then they're taking the grass and the sod and putting that on the outside. This particular home, uh, they would actually add on. A common thing is to add on every year, and eventually it could get as large as a football field for the Unungan uh, culture. Inside this particular uh, structure here, the way to get in and out of this house is actually through the roof. They have a much flatter inside. Uh, that takes you from, you'd actually climb up to the top and go down through the notch ladder to the top there. So this, these doors that we have on the side here, that's there for tourist convenience so that people wouldn't actually have to climb uh, down that notch ladder. So this is the uh, Unungan uh, home here. And then we're standing next to, as we take a quick peek in there, sure. So we'll check on the lighting here. Over here. So we have this notch ladder that I was talking about. So they'd be able to climb up and down this notch ladder. And they're using something called an ads. And so I'm going to point this out really quick. This is our Alaska native version of an app. So you've got, um, in the, so this is our Alaska Native on the notch ladder here. A little, uh, what they need to for the steps on that particular um, going up. Some of the things that we see in here, we have a stellar sea lion. We also have some different types of ring seal and fur seal. And so for these particular cultures, uh, you'll find very beautiful grass bass, uh, well-built uh, kayaks, uh, kayak frame here. And uh, this is one that was made just gives you an idea of the beautiful they're taking. They're driven the wood and they're bending it, and it's contoured and shaped to the size of the hunter, typically about three arm lengths. So they're measuring the height and the weight of that particular hunter that's using that uh, uh, kayak or icky up. Okay. As we walk outside here, we're leaving the Unungan culture. We're going to stand outside the uh, Alutik or the Sukhbiak uh, home here. And so for this particular one, this one is a little bit uh, smaller in scale for the Heritage Center, but uh, these would get a good three times larger. You could have a room going one way another room off to the side, and then another one in the back. And so, again, these would be semi-subterranean homes. So if we're talking about Kodiak Island, for example, 
they do have the driftwood that they use, but they also have wood that uh, actually grows on the island, and so they could uh, utilize different parts of wood. So again, they're keeping it semi-subterranean, but again, for these regions, they're actually having to look for um, brown bears that might have access to their area. So the doorway would actually be a lot lower. They'd make it just big enough for people to get through. And the common thing to do is to zigzag the entranceway left and right so that only humans could get through. And that way the, uh, the bears couldn't get in there. So this is the, uh, the elliptic or the switchback home, okay? All righty. Now we're moving on to a different part of Alaska. We only have about uh, 20, 25 minutes to try to cover some key details around the whole state. So the next area that we're moving up to is the northern part of Alaska, the region that I grew up in, for the Inupak and then all St. Lawrence Island Inupit culture. So within these regions, they live up by the Arctic Circle and also in the up to these regions, there's areas where the driftwood is actually very scarce. You have patches of areas where there may be some trees, and then you have other areas where it's just driftwood. So again, we're using the driftwood that washes in uh, from the ocean. In my region, it's usually late June or early July, uh, where we take that driftwood and we're taking it. The wood is actually treated by the salt water, so we utilize that wood and we use it for the framework for our homes, uh, for our, our kayaks or our kayaks, and then also for maybe our sleds and different things. So the driftwood is very valuable to uh, the Inupak and also the St. Lawrence Island Yupik culture. And we both do uh, semi-subterranean homes. Um, on St. Lawrence Island, they have uh, access to uh, the walrus, and so the that's known as the bull walrus capital of the world. So they're utilizing every part of the walrus, the tusks, uh, the meat, and then also the hide for their boats. So what I'm standing in front of right here, I'll get a good uh, idea of the size of this. So um, what I'm standing in front of are the lower jawbones of a bowhead whale. This is his mouth. And so this represents one-third the size of the mammal. And so what they would do is, one thing that they could do is they would take these lower jawbones from that bowhead whale and they stick it up in front of the beach, uh, right in front of the village. So if you could imagine nothing but flat tundra in the background, and if we pretend like where I'm standing in front of the water here, pretend like that's an ocean. So when we were out boating, uh, we would use it as a landmark or kind of like a lighthouse to find a village. And then that way you could find out where land was and where uh, maybe the community was. Another thing, too, is that if a whaling captain passed away, they would put these above his grave to signify that he was also part of a whaling crew. So uh, the lower jaw bones of a bowhead whale, we utilize every part of the mammal. Uh, we would use the bones uh, for purposes of landmarkers. We could also use the rib cage. If we were low on driftwood, uh, we would use the rib cage maybe for the tunnel entrance. And then, of course, we use the meat to feed our families, which is very valuable to the people of uh, northern part of Alaska. So we're standing uh, right outside the uh, semi-subterranean home. And I know that the uh, reception, because this goes down and inside the building, the reception here, we actually have uh, kind of itchy or uh, sketchy uh, reception inside there. So maybe we should stay on the outside here just so that we don't lose that reception. So again, we're using the driftwood that uh, washes up on the shore and we're using the uh, grass and the sod and that acts like a sponge. And so that grass and that sod uh, is acting like a sponge and it's, uh, it absorbs a lot of that moisture and it helps to keep the, uh, the facility dry. So the larger doorway that we're standing in front of that actually wouldn't be there. If you follow me around the side here, I'm gonna show you where our traditional Arctic entryway is. So. The way that we're looking at the house right now uh, kind of gives you an idea of summer and fall, how that looks. Now, in the uh, winter time, what will happen is the snow is going to pack itself on top of the home, and that the snow actually acts like insulation. So that larger door that we were looking at on the other side of the facility, we actually have uh, what would be our 
Arctic so, um, you would have a small here that goes down to semi-subterranean building. And once you go down and you get inside the home, it actually traps the the hot air inside the building. So this is the Arctic entryway, a cold air trap, and the cold air stays out here and the hot air stays inside the building. So it actually keeps your building very warm and really, really cold. So we're going to leave the northern part of Alaska, which would be for the, we're talking about the Inupiaq and the St. Lawrence Island Yupik. And we're going to head to the southwestern part of Alaska. Uh, we're on a limited time here, so we're going to move on to the other, uh, the other two village sites. So for the southwestern part of Alaska, we have the Yupik and the Chupik cultures. So within the southwestern part of Alaska, their lifestyle is very similar uh, to the Inupiaq and the St. Lawrence Island Yupik culture. Uh, the languages and the dialects will change a little bit. Some of the wording may be similar, but once you start speaking in complete sentences, uh, the Inupiaq and the Yupik languages are, are, uh, are different languages. Um, unless you're living in kind of bordered areas where you may share some common words, but generally the sentences are different. So uh, within the southwestern part of Alaska, uh, generally kind of in August and September, they just finished up maybe going to their family fish camps, getting the silvers that they need uh, to smoke their salmon, and then also picking their berries uh, in August. So we get a, a low bush uh, blueberry, we get blackberries and different things like that uh, that we use for uh, a gouda um, when we're making our, our native ice cream. Uh, or our native berries, we kind of whip that up with uh, reindeer fat or fish, and uh, it's a dessert that we really uh, treasure for Inupiaq, St. Lawrence Island, Yupik, and Yupik. So we're in front of the uh, central Yupik area, and again, if I take my right hand and I go like this, we're talking about this region here for the Yupik and Chupik. The largest structure that we have in the middle here is called uh, Kaznik. It's a uh, men's community house. The smaller homes that are on the side is the na or the women's homes. So a common thing in this particular culture is when the kids are about seven or eight years old, they would separate the boys from the girls. And basically, you'd have the moms, the girls, and the aunts in the smaller homes here learning how to cook, how to sew, uh, maybe how to make a, a small doll and do their stitching so that when they grow up, they can be providers in that sense to make uh, clothing for their family. So... Uh, they're separating the boys from the girls, and it's just uh, a way of going to school. So you have the Kazakh in the middle, the men's community house, where you'd have the dads, the boys, and the uncles, and they could be making things like a fish trap, uh, maybe a, a kayak or a kayak frame. And again, you're measuring out about three arm lengths for that particular uh, kayak based on your height and your weight. They would make a boat or a kayak fit for their size. So you have different regions that make different styles of the kayak. The, uh, the boats or the kayak that are built within the Yupik and Chupik culture, uh, those are really sturdy. They're good to haul cargo from one region to another, another and they're very sturdy watercraft. So this is a Yupik Kuzgit. And uh, this, again, would be semi-subterranean. So this would be mostly uh, under the ground there. Okay, And again, driftwood in the middle, and then you have your grass and the sod on the outside. So Yupik and Chupik culture within the southwestern part of Alaska. Okay, we have a few more minutes here. I'll stop and talk about this structure really quickly. This is actually brand new for the summertime for the Heritage Center. And uh, a gentleman named Charlie Pardue, uh, this actually fits into the next village site that we're walking to. Uh, Charlie Pardue worked with some of our interns this summer, and uh, we have youth that we encourage to learn about their cultures during the summertime. We generally have youth here that are between the ages of 14 to 24 and maybe some elders to kind of guide them through some of the process. Uh, this is actually a fish drying rack and so you would take your poles and you put them across the fish drying rack. You could get a nice smoky fire going underneath there. You could take a burnt piece of wood, uh, maybe some cottonwood for example, and this is just one way of doing it. You would take some cottonwood and put it inside the fire. That gets a nice smoky fire going. 
and then that brings us to uh, making our uh, famous Alaskan salmon strips that people like to uh, like to enjoy. Uh, salmon is actually the fish is actually really good for you. It's really high in omega three, so it boosts up your immune system and lowers your cholesterol. It's actually a fat that's good for you. That omega three is really rich in the fish uh, that is inside um, uh, our food that we have for the fish, and so. Uh, fish is very important to Alaska natives, and that's uh, no exception for the Athabascan people. So now, where we're at right now, uh, we left the southwestern part of Alaska. We're in the interior part of Alaska. So for the Athabascan people, 11 different languages just for the Alaskan uh, Athabascan. So there's 11. I have an example of a uh, food cache over here. These would generally be set further back in the woods they're kind of hidden but we pulled it closer for tourism and so your food cache is it's a lifesaver if you can imagine chair bags 50 below zero in the winter time that would be a good freezer space for your dried meats maybe things like moose caribou and fish and so when you needed that food and you needed that supply uh, you would have a food cache and a ladder there that would take you uh, to your frozen uh, items and so we still use these today actually in rural alaska and then the outside of the home here, this is uh, post-contact, so we're an adaptable people. Uh, so, you, so you can see an example, though, of the Athabascan-style home. So one example that you have is this would be the main living quarters, so the door is kind of lower so that you would uh, trap the heat inside the building. And, of course, today, uh, for a version like this, you would have a door on there. The attachments that's on the side here, that's actually a smokehouse, so they smoke their moose meat and their fish. And uh, we can see another example, a larger example of the, uh, the fish drying racks. And so we have the larger fish drying rack and we have a smaller one. And then I'm going to stand over here. I'm going to show you uh, while we have a minute or two. We have the fish drying rack here and a smaller one here. We also have a small example of a fish wheel. So this particular fish wheel, this is a small one. Just imagine this being seven to eight feet high another four to five feet wide. What they will do is they take this uh, fish wheel and then they set it right down into the river systems in the summertime. So in the summer when the fish start running, what they will do is they take that uh, fish wheel that's seven to eight feet high and the current will spin this around and it catches fish. Once this uh, current uh, starts spinning this fish wheel, the fish get caught in here. They'll go down this chute and right into this bin and the current just continually spins around and uh, catches the fish in this fish wheel. Once they get their quota or the amount that they need, they'll put a stick in there to stop it. Uh, they cut up the fish, they consume it. Uh, maybe they'll feed some of the leftover dried fish to their dogs to keep that energy going for their uh, dog teams. And then when they get low again, they could take the stick out and the current spins this around and catches more fish. And so. They let uh, Mother Nature kind of help and assist in doing that work for them so that they can focus on other chores because Alaska Native people are very resilient, very hardworking people. So anything that can help us uh, naturally to get our work and our chores done, we appreciate something like this. So this is the uh, Athabascan fish wheel and also the fish drying rack that was made by uh, Charlie Pardue and his apprentices. All right, so that's uh, kind of a quick rundown there of our village sites, we, we only had about 25, 20 minutes here where we had to cover the whole state within a short amount of time. So uh, we're heading back to the Alaska Native Heritage Center. Are we going to keep going here until they get to the front, or are we going to turn it over to the other folks inside? Awesome. So uh, we're going to turn it back over to the people inside. I'd like to thank you, Koyana, Gunachish, uh, Chinon and uh, Deutsche Shim uh, for the, following me on this tour out at the Alaska Native Heritage Center in Anchorage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mita and Paul. That was great. That, that was awesome. Um, I'm so glad that you guys were able to share the cultural heritage sites out here. And I hope that everyone that's viewing feels like you got a little bit of a taste of what our house is and what our life would be like. Um, we're so excited to come back inside at the Heritage Center today 
And if you have your octopus bag that you've gotten in the mail, please pull it out um, as we'll be continuing um, the next portion of the tutorial um, with Junior. Uh, Junior is Thingit and um, works here at the Alaska Native Heritage Center. And um, if you've got your thread in utero, we'll be going over to them. Thank you. To be able to watch on the TV. That's like one of my favorite things here at the Heritage Center is doing the tours and talking with people about the tours. I mean, it's just real fun doing those kinds of things here at the Heritage Center. But again, my name is Junior, and today I have Joshua with me. Hello. Uh, this is his first time working on the octopus bag, so he'll be working on it with you guys also while learning with you guys too. I'm trying to untangle my screen here, but give me a second. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> that's it's always like the fun part, you know, when you have, make your thread too long, that it can be an issue sometimes. So I recommend people cut it to small lengths. It's up to you again on like how long you want your thread when you start sewing these down. Uh, but for me, you know, I like to make mine a little bit long, but again, like, I said, when you make it long, you end up getting knots everywhere. And that's not fun at all. It's a process. I'm getting there. Uh, but to just let you guys know, uh, he doesn't know too much. I'm not too sure about who's on and who's watching. But with these octopus bags, uh, these are what we use in Southeast. And Ojibwe uh, use these bags also. So uh, we're not the only people that use them. Now, these octopus pigs are what we use for our regalia when we go out dancing. Uh, we have them on with our vest, stuff like this. Yeah. And this is just what we wear on the side. Uh, they're made differently. Everyone has their own style. So, you know, it's okay to do your, the way you want to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but with these octopus pigs, you know, when we're out dancing, we'll put our cell phones in there, maybe some cough drops or your dance pedals or whatever you need when you go out dancing. Uh, so they're nice little bags to have. So they're almost like fanny packs, you know, you put mm -hmm. the necessities in the bag. Almost done with this knot. Uh, but right now, what I just got him started doing again, uh, we're sewing on the liner to the felt right now. Uh, so that's what you see me working on right now. I am sewing the felt onto the liner. Uh, this is to help keep everything in your bag like nice and tidy and whatnot so things don't get scratched up. Uh, so that's why we have liner on the inside. Uh, but that's what we're doing. That's what I got him started on. Uh, I'm going to take his piece over here and show you guys how to bead. Because uh, we did not get to that part yesterday. Uh, but I'll be doing a little bit of beading, showing you guys how to bead, showing him how to bead also. Uh, but what we did was, if you look right here, I put three beads together. I tacked that on to the legs because mm -hmm. with our work, we always put beadwork on everything. It just makes it beautiful. Um, that's just part of our culture. And with these octopus bags, you know, you can go to Joanne Fabrics or Michaels today and get yeah. whatever color you want. Whatever uh, product you need or anything like that. Yeah. So if you like, if you look at my vest again, this is what we're pretty much doing. We're putting three beads on, putting a space, three beads, a space, and that's what I'm doing for these. But you're welcome to do as you please with your octopus bags because it is your own octopus bag again. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, I'm going to just do the spaces again. As you can look back here, I went through here in the back. So from here, I'm going to take some space. It's up to you guys on, like, how far you want your spacing. I'm going to go about that distance because it looks good. So I poke through the back and come through the front. And I'm always holding on this side of the thread. So when I pull, I'm not going to get a knot. And if I do, I can fix it myself. Uh, but that's a trick for you. I think if, that's where I messed up on the last go around. Yeah. I usually try to hold one side of the thread just in case I end up getting that knot. And mm -hmm. it's not fun getting those knots. Yeah, I just had to cut mine out. 
Uh, so with your beads that are provided in your guys' bags, you guys can get like a little plate. It's up to you guys on like how you want to put your beads down uh, for this. You know, I didn't bring a plate today, so I'm going to just put these on top of the Ziploc bag, just a few. I like to set a few down and set that as my goal because, you know, once you get your goals down, it feels good to finish your goals. So I always try to have a goal for the day when I start doing these kinds of things. Like So from there, since you poke through the back, you're going to get three beads like this. So you just put your beads on. There's one, two, and then three. So from there, I'm going to pull it down. So if you look like that, it'll be close right there. I'm going to hold it right there. And if you look at the end of my thumb, I'm going to poke it through where the last bead should be. Go down, pull through the back. And then from there, from the back, I'm going to come and get back again through the second bead near there. And again, like I said, I like holding one side down and then pulling so that way I don't get those knots again. So if you notice, once I get down there, I like to let go. And then from there, you're going to go through the last two beads. Pull it through. Let go. And then from there, you go down through the last hole again, pretty much by the last bead. Pull it through. And that's how you bead. That's how you tack your beads down. And they should stay there for a long time. Yes. So... That's how it look. Again, I'll take my space, figure out how far I want it. And then, again, like I said, I'll hold this side, pull, so you don't get those knots. Again, you put three more beads on. Now, everybody who's watching, you're welcome to go to the stores or use your own beads. Put whatever colors you guys like. Again, because these are your octopus bags. You can make them whatever color you like because these are for you. Now, if you watch again, I'll go towards the last bead. Poke through the front to the back. Pull through. Again, I'm coming through the back. Right towards the first bead, right in front of the first bead. Sometimes it takes a minute to poke it through, but I'm going to come through back again, through there. It's always nice to work with short thread every now and then. Pull all the way through. Again, go through the last two beads, that way you tack it down. And then again, once you pull all the way through, you're going to poke down through the end towards the last bead, through the back. How long have you been beading for? So I've been beading myself probably since 2007, I think, when I moved to Yakutat. When I was living in Yakutat, that's pretty much when I started learning how to bead. We had a, a beading class in high school, so I took that class because, you know, I wanted to learn part of my culture because we always had beads on a lot of our regalia mm -hmm. so end up taking the class they showed me how to start beading and ever since then I've been pretty much beading on my own uh, with my family there's a couple ways of learning how to bead there's it's like when you ask a beater uh, usually their first question is like do you bead with one needle or two needles uh, the traditional way a long time ago, you would bead with two needles. Uh, so that's kind of like how I first started was beading with two needles. But, you know. And what's the difference with that? How would you go about doing it with two? So with two needles, so imagine like getting your two needles uh, double threaded like this, knotted it, you tie it at the end. Uh, for the first needle, again, you're going to come through the back and pull it through, that way the knot's back there. Mm -hmm. That's the first needle. The first needle, you're going to put all your beads on there. Mm. 
And then your second needle, you're going to come through the back again and then tack it down. Okay. Uh, so it, it's easier that way for some people, but, you know, everybody's different. Everyone learns different ways. Some people are comfortable with two needles. Some people are comfortable with one. So it just depends on, like, what, you, what you're more comfortable with. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, when you do these kinds of things, it feels very therapeutic. You, know, you get to sit down and relax and just it takes your minds off things. Like if you're going through something, you know, you can end up just doing this and it'll help you out a lot. Uh, but when you do these kinds of things, you know, um, you're always welcome to like put music on in the background or listen to music from your area. Because uh, when I do this, you know, it's nice having someone to sit down with and talk to like this also. Yeah. Um, because, you know, when you have a buddy, it just makes things easier, like going to the gym. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to work out by yourself, but when you have a buddy, it just makes it easier. Because I know for myself, when I go to the gym, it's just pretty tough to push myself sometimes because you don't have that motivation. Yeah, for someone to keep you on track. Yeah. But it is coming out pretty good, so if you see that, um, that's how it will look. Now for me, I'm just going to bead right around here all the way to here. And then for the other legs, I'm going to do it from right here to right there, and then same right there, and then right there. I'm going to bead all that, and it should come out looking pretty cool, hopefully. Uh, I'm just trying it out. Uh, you're welcome to bead these how you like. For some people, you can bead the whole leg right here. Just do the whole legs. There's a lot of beads. Yeah. Uh, but for these, you can also bead all along the edges right around here. So if you want, it's up to you. Everyone's different. Uh, for me, sometimes, if this was my own personal bag, I would probably just bead all along it just to make it look fancy. But again, you're welcome to beat it how you like, what designs you prefer. I always like to mix things up every now and then when it comes to doing these kinds of things, because, you know, it gets boring doing the same thing over and over. Yeah, just repeat, it off, repeat it too often and it'll just fail. Yeah. So, you know, I try to do different things, try different colors, you know. When you do these kinds of things, I'm pretty sure, you know, because you're an artist, you mm -hmm. carve. I'm sure when you get frustrated or you're hungry, you, you take the time to take a break, you know? Yeah. Because, you, you know, you don't want that negative energy into what you're doing. Because if you have that negative energy, you know, you'll probably mess up on something. So I'm sure you take breaks, too. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but, you know, when I get... When you get bored with these kinds of things, like let's say you get too bored of sewing this, maybe then you'll go to the beading. Yeah. That way you get to do something different instead of sewing always. So, you know, every now and then I'll do that. Because uh, this is time consuming, but it is worth it once the product is finished. Are all octopus bags hand sewn, or do some people use sewing machines for them? Uh, Depends. Yeah, it's pretty much your personal preference. If you have a sewing machine at home, you can use a sewing machine. But, you know, for myself, I prefer to do it hand sewn because, you know, you put the time and effort That's in it, yeah. and you'll appreciate it a lot more. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's up to you, like, I never used a sewing machine before, but I'm sure it is super nice because you won't have to do as much work. Yeah, I was, cause I was looking at this and I was wondering how quickly you could get this done if you had a sewing machine and then if you put the beads in by hand. Yeah. I'm sure that would be one way to get this process done. Well. Yeah, you, you could definitely use a sewing machine at home if you have one. Um, it does come out pretty nice. You can definitely tell when people use a sewing machine than 
doing it by hand. Yeah. Uh, but that could help you in the process. If you want to get this done a lot quicker, you can use a sewing machine at home. Uh, but I think the one part that takes the longest for these is the beading. Yeah. Because you have to cross back over and come back and yeah. go back and forth. Yeah, you have to definitely go back and forth a lot to tack them down. Now, it is very tedious, but it is very beautiful though, when it is done. Uh, hopefully everyone's having a good day today, you know. People that are watching us do these octopus bags with us together. Um, you know, me and Joshua, we've had a good time putting these together for you guys. Yeah, it's been a process, but it's been worth it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Joshua, he just started yesterday with us, and, you know, he's having a good time with us, and we're getting a lot done. Yeah. Starting at the Heritage Center has been an interesting start, not knowing what to expect, really, but just kind of going with the flow. It's been fun. Yeah. Yeah, working here at the Heritage Center is a lot of fun, you know, uh, especially if you're trying to learn your culture or even other cultures at that, you know. When I first started here at the Heritage Center, I started back in 2005 uh, as a, a culture host. So, you know, I, I started off talking about uh, my house or other houses or I even greeted people at the front uh, but, you know, starting here was really nice because, you know, I was like 15 when I started mm -hmm. and this was my first job. And, you know, growing up as a Native person, you know, it's really hard for some people to do public speaking in front of everybody. Uh, so working here taught me how to speak in front of people and that was a really nice thing to learn. I credit most of my public speaking skills. I mean, you're leading this event right now, so I'm being a little bit more, you know, on the receiving end of the conversation, but I credit most of my public speaking skills to UAA and going to Manage. And when I left Nome, you mm -hmm. know, I, was, I was a lot more shy in terms of speaking in front of crowds or in, in front of audiences. But once I left Nome and got into the swing of, you know, doing presentations or doing any type of announcing or anything like that, it really yeah. helps you build confidence in terms of, you know, not being so intimidated by viewers or crowds or whatever it may be that you're, that you're speaking in front of. Yeah. Yeah, for me, what got me to speak better in, like, a, a huge crowd of, like, maybe 50 people at least, because when you work here, you know, you're always talking to at least 50 people. Yeah. Uh, one thing that helped me talk to people was, you know, I'm not going to see them again. Yeah. So I didn't mind that. But, you know, if I did see them again, you know, it, it's cool. Well, I did have a neat experience the other week at the mall. Because, um, you know, here at the Heritage Center, I demonstrate the Alaska Native Games. Yeah. And I was at the mall just going to buy some things for my brother because it was his birthday. Uh, but this guy came up to me. He was like, hey, hey, hey. And I, I looked a little confused. Like, do I know you? Mm -hmm. And he's just like, oh, you worked at the, the Heritage Center, right? I was like, yeah. He's like, I saw your presentation and your tour. I really appreciate your tour. It was a lot of fun. And, and those games that you showed us, you know, we still play it. I was like, oh, that's really <laughs> cool. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you had a good experience. You know, but I try my best every day to give everybody, like, a show a good time, you know? Yeah. Because it's no fun hanging out with a Debbie Downer. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is, you know, you do this on your off time. Um, do this watching a movie, put on a movie or something. Mm -hmm. Just listen to it. Do you have a way that you specifically like to tie your knots? I know some people just do the typical circle and loop. Is there a specific way that you like to, you know, if you're if you're wanting to start over with new thread or mm -hmm. shorten your thread, is there a way that you do um, so, not quickly? I've seen people do this thing where they wrap the thread around the needle yeah. or something along those lines and then they kind of circle through. You know, my cousin Nay, she taught me 
cool way of doing that, but I forgot how to do that. <laughs> uh, so as far as myself, when I want to tie something off, you know, I'll go through this end, and then I'll poke it through there, and then once I pull it through, I'll go through the loop again, and then pull it. So that's how I like to tie them down if you want to tie it down once you get to that point. Uh, but these are the usually the first steps that we're doing is you're putting the liner on that part mm -hmm. and then we're putting the beads on this part. Now that's usually the first couple of steps and then after you get done with that, um, I'll show you guys how to put on the patch next after I finish this row of beads, which I'm almost done with this leg. Uh, but beading, you definitely have to have patience for this kind of thing, for sure. Um, I think that's how uh, I got my patience, was just doing these kinds of things. Uh, but the reason why I do these things is because, you know, being so far away from home can be pretty tough for some people sometimes. So for me doing this kind of thing, I like to feel like I'm at home when I'm doing this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And when I see my cousins post on Facebook, you know, they do all this kind of stuff too. They do all the beading. And when I see them do that, it makes me want to get stuff done too. So, you know, it's nice doing these kinds of things with your family. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> So what do you think of this so far since this is your first time? I've beaded before, but or I've sewed and beaded before. Mm -hmm. um, don't get me wrong, but I'm still new to this yeah. type of art. Um, it's fun. It's definitely, there's some skills that you have to learn in order for things to go a little bit more fluently. But just as a beginner, I would say it's not too bad. Um, the process isn't that tedious. Yeah. <laughs> definitely getting these bags ready was a little bit more tedious. <laughs> But um, yeah, I mean, it's not that bad. It's it's really, it, it, like you said, it's easy. It's, time passes by really quickly. It's, I mean, it's, it's only felt like it's been a minute since we started, but I'm sure it's been much longer than that. Yeah, you know, time really does go by when you're doing these kinds of things with like, like other people. Yeah, like right now I'm struggling to tie a knot <laughs> to close this off, but I mean, just trying to figure that out is it's the learning process. And, well, that's what I'm here for. If you want me to show you, act it be a good demonstration to show them too. I think I got it right here. But yep, there we go. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, this is definitely a good project for you guys to do during the winter time if you guys end up not getting it done during this time right now. Uh these are really good projects to work on at home. Um I definitely like doing this on my free time. So when I'm at home and I'm not doing anything, I'll just put on the movie and I start beating. Because uh, these are really nice and they're really nice to have. <clears throat> so how's your, is your carving go? How, how long that? Um, I've only done it about three or four times, but um, yeah, just in the early stages of learning. My uncle's from St. Lawrence Island. They're, yeah. all, they're all very well accomplished carvers and artists, so trying to learn um, aspects of my culture through that is, has been fun. Um, it's a learning curve. It's, a lot of, it's, it's, it's very frustrating. Um, mm -hmm. you know, every time you start a new piece, you're working with expensive pieces of ivory, so you, you, every time you start something, you want it to be as good as it can be. Yeah. And you don't want to ruin anything or waste any material since it is a, you know, we're lucky to have yeah. access to those types of resources, but you also don't want to, you know, waste anything or yeah. waste any product. So I, I know a lot of people who first start, um, I have a lot of friends who carve that are my age. Mm -hmm. Some of them are actually very well accomplished artists as well and they make a decent living off of um, their art. They all recommend starting with bone. Um, yeah which is something that I'm going to start working with as well, just so I don't have to, you know, walrus tusks are, they're, they're hard to come by all the time. So yeah. Because you know, it's, 
save those for when I actually feel I have the skills. Yeah, because skill it's not like you can't go to Safeway and buy them. Yeah, you can't go to Safeway yeah. and buy items. So. <laughs> that uh, that makes things, sense. Yeah, it's one of those things where I'm having to pick and choose um, my projects. I can't just do it every day. Um, I'd, I'd waste a lot of material if I did that. So. Yeah. Learning how to do that has been a process. It's, it's also expensive getting tools. It's about $1,200 Holy. to get, like, to get everything you need in order to actually carve the way um, you know professional artists do. Mm -hmm. So it's something that I have to remind myself was you know if I'm going to invest in this, I might as well take it seriously. Yeah, but it's been all right. I mean, no complaints so far. Just need to practice. The more you do it, the better you get. Yeah, That's kind of how I think about it at least. Some people don't agree with that, but. I think that's about the easiest way to go about saying it is, you know, the more practice you get, the better you will be. Yeah, I feel like that's just basically with everything yeah, that you exactly. do in life. Some people don't agree with it, though, with carving. Some people think you can carve and carve and carve and never really find your, your niche. Mm -hmm. That's something that I don't agree with, but who am I to talk and new to the scene? Yeah. I keep making me knock from my... So, see, that's how the leg will look. That's how I'm going to do it on this side. So do you want to do it this way across each um, <clears throat> leg? Or well, are you going to do, no, what for, is your plan for that? For me, the way I was envisioning it is I'm going to do it like this, and then the same with this side right there. Yeah. And then for this, I'm going to do the middle part. Instead of the sides, I'm going to do just the middle on both sides. Cool. And I'm hoping it will come out pretty cool. Uh, but I'm done right here, and I'll show you how I tie my stuff down. Yeah, I'd like to see how you do that, because I've been doing, I'm, I feel like I've been doing it the wrong way. So, I'm going to flip my piece, so that way you can see it better. But right here at the leg is, I usually like to go through the felt, kind of, mm -hmm. a little bit. But I also like to go into the piece of thread. The, for the last one that you put down? Yeah. Okay. So, I like to pull that through until I get really low, and then I like to go through the loop, pull it, and then it should pull all the way down. Oh, that's way better than what I was doing. I and then do around my finger. I like to do it a few more times. That way it's secured, because, you know, I don't want my beads to, like, fall oh, out, yeah. especially all that work I just yeah. did going back and forth. But again, I like to go through it again, pull, and then it should pull all the way to the bottom. Gotcha. You do that a few times until you feel comfortable with your knot, uh, what you feel like. And the strength of it. Yeah, and you mind pass me your scissors, please? Yeah, here you go. Thank you. And then from here, if you see, I'm going to leave a little thread on there, mm -hmm. just like that. And then from there, when you guys are at home, if you guys have a lighter, I like to light mine. Oh, and burn it down? Yeah, so gotcha. that way it stays a little more secured. So that's how I like to tie them off. And here, since I have a bare needle, I mean, you can show them um, yes. how to reset your, reset everything, because I'm not too, like I said, it's been a while since I've sewn, so I mean, obviously thread the needle through the eye. Yep. You just thread, thread it the through. through the eye. Now for you, I notice you've been having troubles, and you guys might have troubles too. With long. So... What I like to do for this, maybe about at least that much, you can cut it off. And then from there, if you're going to double thread it, it's up to you guys on like how you want to do it. You could do single thread or double thread. But again, I like to come towards the back of the two strings right there. And I like to wrap it around, bring it through the loop, and then pull both. Uh, this does get a little tough for me. I don't like tying knots at the end. But go around the loop, pull it through the loop, and I get try to get towards the end. As much as possible. Yeah. And again, you want to leave a little space so that way you can light it and mm -hmm. tack yeah, it no. down. Uh, but again, like I said, I like to do a couple times at least. And this is how you tie them down, really. 
Uh, there are easier ways. If you guys do know how to do those other easy ways, that's all right. Um, it's been a while since I did those fancy ways, like you were talking about. Yeah, some people some will some people wrap it around their, their needle and then yeah, and then like pull it through and it just fits a perfect knot. Yeah, I need to learn how to do that again. I remember my art teacher in high school. She showed us how to do it, and everyone had to have her repeat it a couple times. Uh, but this should be long enough. Cool. Again, uh, if you do that technique where I showed you hold one side while you pull it through. That will help you to not get not totally. Cool. Uh, but there you go. There's your needle. Uh, but there's that. Now we'll show you guys how to patch it on again. So if you look at this piece, this is the piece that's not going to have the liner. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the one that's going to have the beads. You put the that's line. Going to be on the outside, right? Yeah, you put the liner on last because you want the stitches to be hiding once you do it. So you'll bead first, and then you'll get your patch. You can start however you like. Uh, for myself, I started beading, so I could do the patch now, show you guys how to do the patch. You guys should have enough thread in your guys' bags. Uh, but for me, I'm just going to use this thread because it's easier to access for me. For sure. Uh, I'm going to do about arm's length because I've been doing this a lot longer, so um, this is just please. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, for me, like I said, I like to use longer thread, but again, that can be a pain in the butt. You know, even though I've been doing this for a long time, it still can be a pain in the butt. Um, with tail pieces like this um, coming off, the patches, do you, would you recommend using a lighter for that as well? Or? Um, I did try to use a lighter one time. With this patch, this material, it's going to burn too fast. Okay. Uh, so before you start, you know, you're welcome to trim, trim it, it down, trim with, it scissors. down with scissors. Uh, but it's up to you, you know. If you're good with a lighter, you could do it with a lighter. But for myself, I would just use scissors. I recommend scissors. Gotcha. And you would just sew this down just like any other, just yeah. like you would sew the lining on? Yeah, so with the patch, you're just going to sew it down onto the felt. Yeah, and, you know, I can see you're getting a little tired, so it's okay, you know, mm -hmm. to just sit there for a second and take a break, you yeah. know, get a breather, go get coffee, you know, whatnot, stuff like that. Coffee does sound good. Yeah, so, you know, probably after this, we'll probably get some coffee, you know. It, it has been a long morning. Uh, but, you know, we really enjoyed putting these together for you guys, and we really hope you guys enjoyed these as much as we do. Uh, but, you know, for this part, you're going to match it up to the angle you like, wherever you feel like is centered for you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to probably trim this off a little bit so it looks a little more neater. Wrap it up. Okay. Uh, but, you know, uh, for you guys joining us today, uh, thank you for watching. I hope you guys learned enough from us. Um, this was a neat experience for us, and I hope it was a good experience for you guys. And I hope you enjoyed learning it, too, as yeah, well. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, but I want to thank you for everyone watching, and I hope you guys have a good day. And thank you.